the, the Mayan calendar. The, uh, and then had an extremely sophisticated and well-developed um, economy that, that, that moved up and down the Andes um, before experiencing what most theorists think was an environmental collapse that meant that there were all these spectacular but abandoned cities such as Machu Picchu and the uh, peaks of the Andes. So there are the two groups of people, the uh, Quechua, who form a ethnic majority in uh, Ecuador, and the Aymara, who form a distinct um, ethnic majority in Bolivia. Now the constituent assembl assemblies were remarkable because they took place over, over two years in the case of Ecuador, three in the case of Bolivia. And rather than the usual, the way that constitutions are usually formed, which is where they're drafted by a group of, a small group of legal aristocrats, if you will, or at least legal specialists, highly trained people um, who come from law faculties and, and, and worked with governments to develop constitutions. This process was essentially a traveling roadshow that went throughout the country and spoke to every group that was interested in participating. Um, and came up with these constitutions. The idea was that this be, that this be part and parcel of decolonization, and they came up with, as a result of this, the idea of plurinationality. So what does plurinationality mean? The best example is Bolivia. Bolivia is one nation state for the purposes of the rest of the world. <coughs> but is actually comprised of 36 indigenous nations, which are, which are independent, which have a sort of a structure and in a significant degree of, of political and legal autonomy. The structure is much like, for instance, the Iwi of Aotearoa. One people, but culturally distinct. Different groups. They, are, they belong to one people, but they have their own, their own presence and their own autonomy, and they have been accorded significant autonomy in these constitutions. Um, and the idea of cultural diversity, of course, because there's a very significant, um, in, in some of the countries, Italian, but primarily Spanish um, and, and, and Portuguese um, ethnic groups as well, who are, who are dominant in these countries, primarily Spanish. So the idea of um, interculturality, that is that, that there is not one culture that is dominant, there is not one culture that, that is, you know, if you, if you really want to participate in society, you have to wear a suit, you have to learn Spanish, you have to go to the Spanish schools and speak the language, and that's the only way to be anything other than a rural peasant. You know, the idea is, is, is finding, and this is the fundamental part of the process of decolonization, is that the cultures have an equal standard, and that they be. That's what this idea of interculturality is about. As expressed in Article 99.1 of the 2009 Constitution, that it is an essential foundation of the plurinational state community. Um, summed up by, once again, Bob de, Bo de Souza Santos in an interview, there's a political project that's the most important struggle for indigenous peoples in the region, so that there's no one that is dominant, but they all have a part. And these fundamental concepts made their way through the constituent assemblies, through this very wide process of, of, of consultation and drafting, going to civil society groups, both domestic and international, um, uh, through uh, you know, legal entities, um, international and domestic, um, certain legal NGOs. One, uh, I'll give you a very concrete example in a moment. Um, but it was primarily informed, the fundamental concepts were uh, the indigenous ones. Um, and the idea particularly of, of living well, um, there's the different iterations through the different constitutions, when we did in Spanish, we did the end, Castilian, Suma Cose, Suma Camaña in um, Quechua and, and Aymara. These are terms that are not given a huge amount of, of legal definition. They are things that are taken as, as, as given and understood, you know, things that are, that are passed on by um, oral tradition, you know, that, that are an understanding that you will have by understanding the cultures of those countries. So um, you won't find them clearly outlined and defined in the constitutions. Um, so for instance, um, in the constitution of, uh, of Bolivia, um, and this will drive the, the common lawyers nuts, we just find long lists of concepts and words. Uh, you know, so where we're used to, well, there's a three-part test. You go through, you know, part one, two, and three, and it will lead to. There's nothing like that. Uh, these, these are ideas. So there, there are these, you know, indigenous words and concepts. 
Do not be lazy, do not lie, do not steal. All good stuff. I mean, fundamental social values. What's required for the, the, the continued survival and flourishing of any society? Um, but there's a larger body of literature um, where this is where this is well defined, but it's not it's not legal literature. So we have these these values which are put here, and, and it's looking at this though. I mean, this is this is beautiful stuff. This is this is poetry. Um, but there is a fundamental difference in the way that constitutions are applied in these countries. The change is going to be slow and incremental, because a lot of the constitutions, particularly the constitutions in um, certainly in the Anglo-American tradition, when when if something's in the constitution. Uh, <coughs> Let's take America, for example. If something's in the Constitution, that is an enforceable promise. And it is, it is taken very, very seriously, and a lot of law is built around that. In Latin American countries, South American countries generally, in fact, in a lot of the civil law countries, constitutional statements are not the sort of rock-solid commitment that they tend to be in countries in a common law tradition. They are more, they're more guidance. Um, and, and when we get to um, how some of these laws have been applied, um, we'll see that there's a flexibility there. It'll take time for them to take effect. But the statements are, are right. They're fantastic. The thing I want to draw out of this is this idea of, of Pachamama, which is the indigenous conception of nature. That's why all environmental thinking and law in, in these countries, in Bolivia and Ecuador, they share the word. In fact, all around the Pacific, there are similar words. Uh, in the Māori have uh, papatuanuku. In Hawaii, there's papahananuku, um, pachamama. There are, there are similar words, similar sounding words, all, all around the outside of the Pacific that encapsulate this concept of nature as a holistic living entity. So not a thing, not, not nature, not the environment, which in itself is a telling term, if you think about it. An environment is a container for human activities. It's a thing that we can parcel up and divide and use for our purposes. It's, it's, it's instrumental value. That's what it's about. But what the indigenous cosmos is young, what the indigenous worldview brings to this is the idea that, that nature, and in fact it's an earth mother deity, a fertile earth mother that gives us all our life, without which we can't survive, and that cannot be considered separately. That cannot be parceled off into substrata of minerals, strata titles, etc. But it's all part of one thing. Of course, legal rights for property and ownership are recognized, but when you're dealing with and talking about nature, um, and, and in fact, and, and getting away from, and this is the really underlying um, ideological um, or, or the fundamental concept, is getting away from the dualism, the split that's inherent in, in Western thinking, certainly in the Anglo-American tradition, that nature is divided essentially into human and non-human. Later on, I'll refer to uh, rights, or, or more accurately, legal personality, for non-human nature. Because that is the division in our law, and that is the division in, in, in our philosophy, for the most part, mm. is between human and non-human. In, in the law of New Zealand, according to the Animal Welfare Act, um, Resource Management Act. There are humans who were very special. We have human rights. We have you know all, all sorts of you know rights and benefits and, and considerations that are afforded to us. Anything that's not human is a form of property. There are some things that aren't that aren't directly owned or that, that are that are crown property. But um, all other animals, everything, um, dogs, horses, cows, pigs, dolphins, chickens, you name it. They all they belong to someone. They belong to something, but they are nothing more than property. And we have a very separate status for humans. Everything else is essentially something that is controlled by humans. So the idea of living well, the the vivir bien, the summa cause, etc. These fundamental concepts. They're about a sort of a well. There's an Aristotelian conception of the good life, you know, which is it's a kind of a virtue ethic. Um, of, of having an idea of what is good, rather than a good life being free from constraint, a good life being about uh, the freedoms that we have, much as the way our property rights are defined in our system of law. You know, it's, it's the right of exclusion. Um, many of what we, much of what we call rights in the in the Bill of Rights, for instance. Um, you know, there's a lot of academic argument about well, are they really rights or are they just liberties? You know, freedom of speech, for instance, the right to freedom of speech. 
It's not really a right, it's sort of a sphere of non-interference. No one can stop you from doing that. That doesn't mean that you have an inherent right or an inherent vision of what is good. It's connected with, with flourishing um, and the protection of non-human nature and living alongside it. It's still very much that, that dualistic and instrumental view of nature. And that's, that's specifically what these, these world visions, these, these um, world views, should I say, are intending to move away from. Now, one thing that is, is one of the major takeaways from this constitutional movement is um, the provision, Article 71 of the 2008 Constitution of Ecuador, which created what is often called rights of nature. And I, and I quote unquote rights because it's more accurately legal personality or legal personhood, meaning that it's a move away from treating all things that are non-human as a species of property. Um, the, the, the person to look up is, is Christopher Stone, um, an article called Should Trees Have Standing? Great academic fun title, as in legal standing. Toward Legal Rights for Natural Objects, written in 1972, um, where he talks about the, the unusual situation in law where corporations have legal personhood. A corporation can sue and be sued. It, is, it has legal personality, um, which a, um, a cow doesn't, for instance. Um, a ship has legal personhood. I mean, a ship was a floating corporation back in the days. It was the representative that was a little bit of England or, or whatever out there in the rest of the world. Um, and, and still has legal personhood. It's referred to as, as, as a sheep. And when you seize a ship at port for non-payment of excises or, or owing money or whatever, you're actually said to arrest a ship that is a legal person. And yet living, intelligent, sentient beings are not legal persons. They have no legal personality whatsoever. And the first question, when you're looking at what can we do with this thing? Can we build a bridge over it? Can we mine it? Can we take it apart and sell it off? Can we sell it? Can we whatever? The first question, and often the only question, that needs to be asked is, do they have standing? If you want to review or repeal any decision, um, or, or do anything through the courts, or with relation to the state, um, the first question is, do you have standing to do that? Locus standi. Basically, do you have the ability to be recognized by the courts or the government to bring this legal action? or claim, or insist that there be an administrative review of the decision. So for instance, um, it's not enough to be very concerned um, about a tree being chopped down, or that Maui's dolphin are being fished out of existence. You can't just turn up and say, I'm really concerned that I'm going to bring an injunction in the High Court against the trawlers that are doing that, or the people who are going to chop that down. You can't do it. You have to demonstrate that you have standing. You have to demonstrate that you have some interest, generally a property interest, or that your interests as an individual will be somehow affected. That's a, it's a broad brush approach to the, to the issue of standing. So you have to, you actually have to have the right to do that. And what Stone proposed, and what has made it into law, is that by recognizing, not, not making them, not making them uh, <coughs> equivalent to humans, um, you know, and, and obviously there are the easy uh, uh, reductio ad absurdum arguments that, oh, we'll be having uh, dogs driving cars next, etc. People have actually written this kind of stuff. <laughs>